it's interesting. Normally on a production, I would do a lot more research. I think in a way, because this is such a, a sort of primal play, and it's a response to Liz's writing and Euripides' original concept, that a lot of the research I was doing was not very specific. It was about things like textures uh, and responding to the room that we're in. So initial designs uh, were looking at a blue kind of world that was one to the blue that's in this room. And so I was looking at, you know, metal container ships and thinking about refugees and containers and shipping and kind of the journey that they've been on and almost um, Medea as an outsider that's, that's sort of come into this world. So I did look at quite a lot of sort of images of of refugees and of, or of that kind of world, but then increasingly started thinking more about the world of King Creon, the world that she's in, uh, and that in a way it's a sort of, it's a world of male power. We're also, I get the feeling or in it, and this is my own personal thing, that it's sort of slightly in decay, you know, and, and, that, uh, and that he's not. And therefore there was something about, you know, the industrial heritage of Scotland and using metal and rusted metal that felt kind of quite interesting as a symbol, both of quite kind of masculine, robust, sort of powerful structures, but also something that's sort of like on the turn and beginning to beginning to rust. So in a sense, that's how we've ended up with a kind of rusty version of the design rather than a kind of bright blue one. We've always felt that the walkway is a very important element of the design in terms of there's a sense in the piece of Medea, her world, her doorway into her house, and then the outside world that everybody comes from. So King Creon, uh, Jason, Glauke, they all come from the palace and we never see the palace, it's just sort of over there. Um, and so that route in is very, and the dynamic of that and the long entrances of somebody of power arriving to Medea, who was once powerful but is now powerless, felt very sort of important. So there's a lot in the design that you wouldn't think of necessarily as a kind of what design does, but what it's trying to do is shape the way that the characters interact in the space. So creating these long entrances uh, which sort of create these kind of standoffs. And also because of the height it's at and the nature, it kind of almost feels like a fashion catwalk as well. So there's a sense of strutting, there's a sense of showing off. There's also the sense of the characters being aware of the audience too. So when Ken Creon comes on and he kind of goes, I'm not a tyrant. He's actually looking at everybody in the audience as our subjects and going, you know, I'm not a tyrant. I, I'm not going to behave badly. I'll give her a second chance. So the kind of the design is helping to do that. And that's one of the sort of things that I guess people don't realize a bit about what design does. It's not just about a pretty picture or, or setting it in a in particular world. It's about shaping a space that the actors will interact in and how the dynamics kind of work within that space. So one of the tools the designer has, obviously I, I do a lot of sketches. And so in my process initially, I had photographs of the venue and then I would be sketching over the top of them on an iPad and trying out lots of ideas. So that was how I kind of tried out blue versions. I tried gold versions and gradually moved into this more rusty aesthetic. Uh, and then the other sort of big tool that we use is to create models. Uh, in this case, a one to 50 versions. Normally it's one to 25, but also like a person is sort of that high. And so that's a really useful tool for seeing how in three dimensions the set kind of fits in the, in the space and how it's going to work. And then that's also something that I then take to the scenic artists along with references. So there's a sort of sense of how the, the paint finish wants to be in the model. But then I also bring kind of references of other rusted metal and then work with them. They create samples for me so that you'll kind of try out on a piece, you know, is these the right kind of rust tones that you want and how, what kind of pattern, because, you know, I mean, actually there's lots of different versions of rust. So everyone goes, oh, you know, you become a slight connoisseur of rust as a, a designer like me. But so, um, so that kind of the model has been really useful from that, but, it, but it's just a kind of tool on the way towards the set. So for me, it's a thing that I do for discussion with other people. And then you work on the real thing and you put the model to one side and go right now, let's see how it works in real life under the real lights and what do we need to do to make it work.
this space, the hub, is quite, a, I would say it's quite a challenging space. Uh, I don't know who the architect or interior designer was, but basically they've taken this Gothic church and uh, created some very bold <laughs> design decisions within it. So the walls are actually hiding very useful acoustic absorbent material. So actually as an acoustic space, it's brilliant. So I mean, that is great from a design point of view that you know that you don't have to mic your actors and that they can talk around the room and, and talk to everybody. So that that's that's a fantastic gift of the space. But there's a lot of very bright blue. There's some strange sort of diamond shaped patterns on the walls. There's a balcony front that's been painted a kind of mustardy cream color. Uh, so there's a lot of different colors and textures. And for a long time in the design, I was trying to respond to the Gothic nature of the space. And the pillars in the set, I was originally going to do as black pillars, like the pillars that are here. And then what gradually happened is I felt, A, I it didn't really feel very interesting to be doing that, just be copying the kind of the room uh, and so but I wanted to still respond to the proportions of the room so the walls line up with the balcony the pillars line up with the pillars in the room so the proportions of the piece of the set sort of sit within it and then interestingly the rust color sits quite well between the kind of purple of the curtains the kind of mustard color of other pits and and so that kind of works so it, it's both sits within the space and it looks like it's meant to be there but it's also different from it so that's so hopefully as an audience, you're kind of clear, ah, oh, this is the world of the play that I'm looking at, and this is the world of the kind of the audience. So what you have in the set is a, is a kind of rusty metal box, effectively, with walls that kind of line up with the balcony fronts of, of, of the building. And then it's raised about a meter 20 off the ground so that the standing audience on two sides is the walkway that runs right through the middle of it and then the audience is split into two groups on either side uh, and so that means that the audience will always are always aware of each other as well which i think is a kind of important thing it's not the kind of show where like you know, one called traditional theatre, where you are st you are a, f a blank fourth wall looking through a proscenium arch. It's very much a kind of a, an environment where we're all sharing the story together, and there will also be audience up on the balcony and some seated around the back as well. So, hopefully, there'll be this sort of wall of people and faces filling that whole thing, and then the walkway running through the middle of it creates this very kind of dynamic kind of entrance through. Uh, and then there's a one small door, which is the kind of route out into her house. So that's where Medea goes. That's where she kills the children. We never see that. So that's always that's the kind of Greek tragedy thing that you don't actually see that and you don't see her effect on Glauchy when she sends the poison crown. So all of that happens off stage and then is reported back. And, you know, past the power of that, the, you know, you do get the shock of Jason comes out covered in blood when a deer comes out covered in blood, so you get that visceral impact that you know that they have, that they've you know Jason has been cradling his dying children, but a deer has killed them. So you see that, but you don't kind of see the violence. And in a way, that's hopefully kind of more powerful than than seeing it itself. And then the other big intervention you have in the space is with Colin Grenfell's work, who's the lighting designer. Uh, and so obviously, Colin's developed a whole rig of lights for the show and did a lot of pre-work about how to make sure that you don't blind the audience you know so you can still see the actors but the audience are looking out and they don't get kind of blinded so he's got uh, this strip of led lights that run all the way down so you get a strong the, the lights are as much almost part of the design and the architecture of them that kind of run down and then he's also got this massive light that's outside the doors that the audience come in through and the way to the outside world and we've used that for the entrance of the king, his daughter, uh, Jason. So all the kind of people coming from the palace, the kind of so in a way that brings both a naturalistic sense that it's kind of a bright, shiny day out there, but also the sense of power of um, this character coming in and bringing this light in, light in with him. And that's quite a sort of brutal light. It's quite hard for the actors to work with, but because it, it really does go into your eyes. But it also, and it also for me exposes every last crease on any costume or anything. So it's sort of, it's again, it's like a catwalk, and that's something that Michael, uh, the director, is very kind of passionate about. Is that you know actually 
really focusing in on the actors and, and on the story. And in a sense, that's what I feel the design should be doing is, um, or any design should be doing, it should be creating a focused, charged space within the performance that enables the actors to tell their story as clearly and as powerfully as possible. And, and, and you're supporting that, but you're not illustrating it or getting, it, getting in the way of it. But then also I've responded to the colours in the palette of the costume. So for example, the people who kind of live in the palace kind of world. Uh, so Glauke and uh, who's the daughter of Creon. It's the morning of her wedding in the play. So she's not yet in a wedding dress, but she's in a very nice blue satin dress and her hair is sort of elegantly done. And Medea calls her sort of like she like a, a bit of fluff that she can kind of blow away. And But there is that sense of the kind of young woman coming into this world and sort of being very sort of self-conscious, but aware of her impact. So she comes in bringing that blue color in and the same with Jason, his wedding suit is blue. Um, and then Medea, we've been on an interesting journey of her costume color in that initially tried various dresses uh, with a Jura that were kind of in color and things like that. And then interestingly, Michael saw her wearing a kind of black outfit in one of the photo shoots when someone came into film rehearsals and felt that that was sort of had a stronger edge to, to the character. So we found a dress that kind of works for that. And then the chorus are also in monochrome in blacks and greys. So there are moments when Medea kind of joins hands with the chorus and it's almost like they become a kind of, you know, a monochrome kind of mass of kind of women are all enraged and angry about the injustices of the world. So she sort of, and that black still stands out against the, the rust colors of the set. So I've used sort of that color sort of there. So there are lots of decisions that the building are unconsciously or consciously I'm kind of responding to in, in the kind of color palette, whether an audience actually even recognizes that, I'm not, I'm not sure, but that's what I'm doing behind the scenes. So the National Theatre of Scotland has a very strong uh, sustainability uh, ethic that was very much coming under the, the pandemic and people have been working on for a long time called the Green Book. And that's all about basically trying to be as sustainable as possible in a production. So for this one, we've uh, basically tried to source reclaimed materials. So all of the girders that you can see, they're actually wooden and they were in a previous production and they've been made and adapted by the Citizens Theatre Workshop. And then the steel floor is actually real steel kind of plate because I, li I like that kind of truth to materials and you can feel it. And also because the audience are literally leaning on the on the set you know that it has to be real so that you know they can see that it's actually real rust uh, on, on the metal but that's been screwed down and glued with special glue that means we can peel it all off and and, and, and reuse it another time the backs of the flattage has all come from Perth so this bit and the set has been painted by uh, the Lyceum workshop. So there's been a kind of cross Scotland kind of collaboration of lots of different craft skills and sourcing materials at different places. So that has been really useful. And then all of the decking that we're sitting on, that's all called steel deck and that gets recycled all the time. So we're trying to be as, um, as green as possible. And then as a designer, I'm thinking ahead of, well, actually, if this show doesn't isn't stored and, and they and they just want to get rid of it at the end then actually there's material here that I can use for future productions in Scotland maybe you know so look out for some rusty metal popping up somewhere else in Scottish theatre maybe in a few years time who knows that the people you're dealing with in the play mainly are the aristocrats uh, and there's a couple of characters the nurse and the the serving man who kind of report about that quite often talk about their lowly status in relation to the, the and how they don't have the same high powered uh, emotions that the aristocratic people have. And so there's something quite interesting about, you know, making a kind of a world in the audience of the kind of the groundlings who are regarded as the kind of, you know, the ordinary people and then slightly raised above them are these characters. So there's sort of a deliberate decision there. And then also being able to sort of hide your chorus within uh, the audience. So initially the first few lines the chorus have, they kind of emerge from the audience. They're gonna have little stools that they bring with them and then they can stand up and kind of appear a head height above the people around them. So that, 
you know, hopefully, I mean, people will probably notice that there are these people who are coming in carrying little stools. It seems slightly strange, but, and, you know, it's Edinburgh Festival, so, you know, people might arrive with a stool to watch a, a promenade show. Um, but then, and then they kind of emerge out of the audience, and then other times where people go through it. It's a kind of really powerful kind of image, I think, of the, 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 the thrust going through the middle. And then because we've got the balcony as well, that gives the opportunity for, you know, people to look down. And it's great for the actors that, for their eye line, you know, that they're looking, sometimes they're looking down, and then they're also going to look up, so it gives them the kind of whole room to kind of relate to. You know, as a designer, as you go on in your career, you're sort of expected to do bigger and bigger shows. So like I've done Rizulka, big opera down the road as well. So that's a big full on piece with, you know, 2000 people watching it. This is much more intimate, 300 people or something. And, and I really love working at this scale because for me, that kind of human connection is what theatre's about. Mm -hmm.